Miss Lanier. This early, you'll have to take the local. All right, Phil. Executive, Mr. Lanier. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, Miss Lanier. Good morning, Martha. I couldn't find a cab anywhere. Such a lovely day, though. Fortieth floor executive, Ramsey and Company, Miss Stevens. I'm sorry, sir. Our switchboard doesn't open till nine. You should be able to reach him shortly thereafter. And that's correct, sir. Mr. Stables begins with the company today. I'll leave you a message on his desk. Anne, would you put this on Mr. Staples' desk, please? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Staples will be in Mr. Quinn's old office, executive corridor. Yes, I know. I said deliver it, not read it. Yes, ma'am. Executive, 40th floor, Miss Stevens. Morning. Hi. Oh, hi. oh, good morning, madam. I wonder if Marge is going to go to work next here. door. Somebody oh, has no. Me. Well, I'm glad I don't. It's not there. Maybe. Well, they really fixed up a new exec's office for him, didn't they? Very nice. A new man. Right next door to your boss. And awfully close to Mr. Ramsey. Mm -hmm. So happens it's a new man. What's his name? Staples? Mm-hmm. We'll be working with Mr. Briggs. That's why they have adjoining offices. Marjorie, baby, you're awfully defensive. I guess that's because you're worried about your Mr. Briggs. Run along, will you? May I have some more cream, please? Please. Next car, next car, please. Okay. Next car. Harry, Charlie, Joe, express down. No stops for Jen. Next car. Next car. Next car, please. Next car. Next car. Good morning, Mr. Ramsey. Next car, please. All right. Lenny? Yes, sir. Miss Lenny, Miss Stevens. He's here. Thank you, Martha. Chief Operator, please. Miss Phillips, you can put this morning's three long distance calls through to Mr. Ramsey. Portland, Dallas, St. Louis offices. Good morning, Mr. Ramsey. Good morning, Miss Lenny. Any messages? You have calls placed for our Portland, Dallas, and St. Louis offices. Nothing else important, sir. Martin Toulon died. You said you'd wire him. Yes, you'll find a copy in my briefcase. You're right as usual. Nothing important. I have the Portland report in my briefcase. I want it teletyped this morning to Seattle. Have someone there drive over to Portland and get it to Johnson before lunch. Then run off 20 copies, confidential mimeographing, and have them ready in time for the board meeting. I want it on the agenda. Has Mr. Staples arrived yet? Not yet, sir. Delay that meeting until 10 this morning to give you time to get the report mimeoed and distributed. I want it read, and carefully. Get word underground to their secretaries that no one is to count on making any early luncheon appointments. And make a note. Staples is to sit one down from Van Deventer on my left. Yes, sir. Let me know as soon as Mr. Staples arrives. Yes, Mr. Ramsey.
Ed, here we are. Yeah, here we are. A little different than Mansfield, isn't it? Now I know what a mother feels like when a child goes to school for the first time. Oh, well, goodbye, Mother. Looks big, doesn't it? Oh, give me a chance, honey. Maybe I can cut it down to my size. Well, I'm a little late. Shall I call you when I... No, no, no. You, uh, go on home after you finish shopping. And find a garage somewhere around Midtown to park the car. Uh, I'll phone you on what train I'll be on, huh? Bye-bye. Goodbye, darling. and company, the board said... Yes, sir, executive or administrative? Oh, the executive, Mr. Ramsey. 40th floor, sir. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Oh, uh, you want the tower, sir. The tower elevator, sir. It'll be down in a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. My pleasure, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Jamie. Good morning, Bill. Morning, Marge. How was the weekend? Fine. Your letters are on your desk, and the coffee cart will be here in a minute. I can use some coffee. Didn't you get any rest at all? Couldn't even take my kid to the double header. Oh, what a shame. That planning report's going to be a real job, Marge. This will be a big week for you, too, with that thing. I believe we'll try a rough first draft. Long? No longer than the telephone directory. Phew! Marge. Has Mr. Staples come in yet, Marge? No, sir. Staples? Yes. I'm Margaret Lanier, Mr. Ramsey's secretary. Oh, how do you do? Mr. Ramsey would, of course, be here to welcome you himself, but you called him on a long-distance call. May I take you back to your office? Well, thank you very much. And on our way, I might show you some of our other departments. Have you met Miss Stevens? I introduce myself, Miss Lanier. Fine. And may I bid you my own personal welcome? We're very glad to see you. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Now, if you'll just come with me, Mr. Staples. Miss Stevens. Marketing and sales are below here. We have our own research department on the 40th floor. Perhaps you'd like to see that later. This is the executive corridor. Mr. Ramsey's office is that one down at the end. Then Mr. Jameson, head of purchasing. Mr. Briggs. You'll be working closely with Mr. Briggs. Mr. Van der Venter, chief engineer. And this is your office. Isn't it nice? I hope you like it. Mr. Ramsey was told by someone in your old office that you were especially fond of this period. Wasn't your office in Mansfield furnished in early American? My furniture consisted of two filing cabinets and a surplus metal desk off of a destroyer escort. No, it's, uh, it's really very attractive, very. I, I appreciate it very much indeed. Excuse me, Miss Lanier. Anne said you wanted to see me. Oh, yes, Marge. Mr. Staples, this is Miss Fleming. How do you do? How do you do? Marge, will you see that Mr. Staples has everything he needs in the way of office equipment? It was arranged for this morning at Mr. Briggs' suggestion. Oh, fine. I must rush now, Mr. Staples. Again, a most cordial welcome. Thank you very much. And, uh, Marge, will you step by at my desk when you finish here, please? Yes, Miss Lanier. I think I better explain the phone system, Mr. Staples. There are four lines. One is your private line, direct to outside. Two is for conference calls. Three is for inter-office. And four, this button, is for your secretary. Oh, I'm sorry. May I? Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, I think I have that. Uh, let's see. Outside, inter-office, uh, conference. Uh, yes, that's... Fine. Thank heavens, this isn't early American. Busy? No. No, not at all. Oh, you must be... Uh... Bill Briggs, your next-door neighbor. Yes, of course. Well, I'm certainly glad to meet you, sir. I, I think uh, Mr. Ramsey told me you'd been sick, didn't he? Oh, did he? Actually, it's just a 
Just a pesky stomach that's been acting up on me. You just in from Mansfield? Yes, they took a house for... Uh, oh, uh, sit down, Mr. Brace. Settled already? Good. I'm not trying to set myself up as a real New Yorker. Altoona, Pennsylvania, that's where I came from. My first trip home, I was wearing spats. I remember my father not being able to get over it. He says, Bill, Bill, he says, you went to New York to see the sights, and instead you become one of them. <laughs> Well, we just got here Friday afternoon, so this morning, Nancy insisted, uh, my wife, she insisted on driving me to work the first morning. <laughs> you know the way women are. You know, you you come out of a small town plant, you, <laughs> you feel a little lost in a place like this. Well, as I was saying, you know, we uh, walked into our house Friday afternoon. We'd never laid eyes on the place before, you know. And there it was, furnished like a magazine, milk in the icebox, bourbon on the shelf, and... I don't know. You got to hand it to them the way they do things around here. Yes. Miss Lanier handles all that. Does a fine job. That feeling that I got driving into town this morning. Well, I got to admit, it's just, uh, it's just a little overwhelming. <laughs> yes, and it's a pretty wonderful thing to be as young as you are and see it all spread out in front of you like a, like a Christmas tree. You know. You think of, uh, you think of big business, you always think of it as being very impersonal, you know? But, uh, it's certainly not true with your Mr. Ramsey. I know what you mean. How much time did you put in in Mansfield? Almost six years. You must have blown a bugle in Ramsey's ear out in Ohio. He brought you here in a hurry. <laughs> Well, actually, I wasn't at all sure I wanted to come to New York, but uh, this Ramsey is a pretty dynamic man. Yes, I know. You see, you, you've been with the firm some time now, haven't you? Oh, maybe 40 years or so. I seem to recall Mr. Ramsey's talking about you as a production man. You're an engineer, aren't you? Yes, but uh, from what he told me, I guess I'll be a little of everything around here. Mostly in industrial relations. Industrial relations? Matter of fact, it's been one of my specialties. We... We ought to get along pretty well together. I'm sure we will. Excuse me. Mr. Ramsey's called a meeting in the conference room, Mr. Briggs. Oh? Well, Fred, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Mr. Randy's expecting Mr. Staples, too. Oh. Well, then, I'll, uh, I'll go in with you, if you don't mind. Not at all. I just hope Mr. Ramsey remembers hiring me. Mr. Ramsey rarely forgets anything. After you. Thank you. Staples? Yes. Hello. Fred, Hello. Uh, this is Harvey Jameson, head of purchase. Oh, uh, how are you? So they finally finished it. What? Oh, Fred, your office on Friday, the painters and all, it was a madhouse. Say, Bill, are you taking along Ramsey's breakdown? Oh, no, I forgot that. Uh, a couple of other things I forgot, too. Uh, Jamie, would you and Fred go along together? I'll be in uh, in a few minutes. Fine. I suppose Lanier's giving you the cook's tour. What? Oh, yes. Did he show yes. you the conference room? Oh, yes, from the other side, yes. Mr. Briggs? What is it, Marge? I don't know. Mr. Briggs, I think I ought to resign. Resign? What are you talking about? What happened? What is it, Marge? Mr. Briggs, I've just been ordered to go over to Mr. Staples as his new secretary. Temporarily? No, I don't think so. Who gave this order? Mr. Lanier. When? About five minutes ago. I'm supposed to break in your new secretary. They've picked a new secretary for me? Yes, I think so. It's out of the question for you to resign, Marge, to even think of resigning. You're a fine, wonderful woman and a great secretary. That's the reason they want you over with Staples. He'll need someone like you because he's new here and they want him to get into harness fast. But who can tell, Marge, one of these days, that stomach of mine, pretty perverse organ, and I'm tired. Do you know, is it... Must to all men. Mr. Briggs. Have you any idea who your successor is? Yes, they've chosen Sylvia Trammell. Miss Trammell. It is so ordained. So be it. 
she knew. But she's supposed to be very good at dictation. Well, we'll give her a chance to prove it. Briggs. If I could only tell you what this job has meant to me. What working with you has meant to me. All right, kid. Wash up, get your money, and get out of here. <laughs> and give Mr. Staples all the best you've got in you. I know you will. That's the only way you operate. I like the guy. I have a feeling he's going to carve out a career around here. Yes, sir. Everybody seems to think so. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, gentlemen. Mr. Ramsey will be with us in a moment. Been away, have you? Oh, sorry, Fred. I was held up for a few minutes. See you later, Fred. Now, where are we going to sit you? Oh. Here's an empty chair. I guess you can sit oh, right uh, here. Oh, Mr. Staples, will you sit over there, please? Right next to Mr. Van de Venter. One down for Mr. Ramsey, please. Welcome back, Bill. Feeling better? Much, thank you. A little stomach. Good. I'm glad it's cleared up. John, uh, don't forget that contract. Can you get it through tomorrow? I think so. I have a problem. Oh, yeah. First, gentlemen, I'd like you to look over the Mimeo sheet on top. Haverford Mutual had some doctors look into the matter of executive diets. Their findings showed incredible deficiencies. They've gotten up some food tables. I've had them mimeoed. I'd like you to look them over. As you know, it's been my feeling that a healthy executive is an efficient one. <laughs> I think it's not amiss now to introduce the newest member of our team, Mr. Fred Staples. He's from Mansfield, Ohio. As you all know, he was general manager of Queen City Tool and Die until we took it over. His record there was a brilliant one. He's a production engineer by training, an industrial relations man by instinct. I expect good things from him. Oh, you've probably met everyone, but uh, just for the record, reading from left to right, Mr. Jameson, head of purchasing. Yes, man. Mr. Granigan, controller. Well, Mr. Gordon, head of sales. How are you? Mr. Latham, head of service. Yes, Mr. Portier, chief of operations. Oh, yes. Nice knowing you. And Mr. Van Deventer, chief engineer. How are you? Nice to see you. It's a pleasure. Oh, and uh, of course you've met Mr. Briggs. Oh, yes. Who is our vice president, assistant general manager, in charge of everything that everybody else forgets to be in charge of. <laughs> <laughs> now, gentlemen, you all have before you a copy of the Williamston plant purchase prospectus. Mr. Jameson, did you attach your supplements? It's right there, Mr. Ramsey, page uh, 17R, under process equipment. And uh, Mr. Granigan, the stock purchase plan I outlined, I have your comments here? Uh, you do, Mr. Ramsey. Good. Feasible, is it? Very much so, in my opinion. Good. Well, that about winds it up, unless there are any further points to be made. I do think, Mr. Ramsey, if we could keep the transaction under wraps for a bit, at least during the preliminaries, you know, what'll happen to the stock quotations if it leaks out that we've agreed to purchase. I've arranged it this way. The stock quotation as of yesterday morning... You seem to be straining at the leash, Mr. Briggs, or am I mistaken? You mentioned here that probable time of purchase would be sometime in June. Are the plants to be in receivership until then? That seems to be what it says. That means six months with improper maintenance of equipment. Oh, I doubt it, Bill. I've had two of my best men out there for the last six weeks. Oh, we had a varying voltage problem, but that was taken care of. You know, maintenance-wise, I doubt if there'll be a thousand dollars worth of deterioration. How about goodwill? What about it? The plant employs 900 men. That's half the working force of the village. So? So what do we do with these men? Cover them with cosmoline and put them away in a drawer until we get ready to resume production? I thought your concern was for the plant. And what good is the plant without the men? You chop a village payroll in half for six months and you might not have a plant because you might not have a village. Mr. Briggs, if we may be permitted to disregard for the moment the considerations that you have brought up, what about the rest of the plan? I'd say it was adequate. Adequate? That gentleman is the kiss of death, believe me. I've known Mr. Briggs for a long time. 
when he says something is adequate, what he means is that it is entirely inadequate. I must admit to feeling a concern over some 900 men suddenly deprived of a livelihood. Mr. Briggs, if you would do me the goodness to look at what I consider to be a fairly elementary business principle. By putting 900 men out of work temporarily, we may ultimately employ twice that number in the same town. By cutting production costs as a result, we will then be able to compete more favorably in the market. Thus, we'll be able to sell more goods. We're not going to ruin that town, we're going to make it. I should think, Mr. Briggs, that after 30 years, you'd be able to think beyond the tongue-plucking stage and come up with something resembling an analytical point of view. I was under the impression I'd given you a point of view. I saw none. I perceived what amounts to a rather emotional little tidbit that was decidedly more charitable than cooperative and by no means thought through. I asked, I believe, for an objective view of a business venture. From you I got, and I seem constantly to be getting, a very negative response, if any at all. Adequate, I believe you said. Well, Mr. Briggs, this little move will save us conservatively half a million dollars, which we'll be able to put back into the business. I must say you take a liberal view of adequacy. I didn't intend to make a central issue out of this, but I did feel it important enough to air in this meeting. Well, you have aired it in this meeting. I think it's a good thing you did. But I think, Bill, we're pretty much of one mind about it now. And we may assume the matter is closed now. Mr. Briggs. How about you, Mr. Staples? Do you have an opinion? No. No, I think not, Mr. Renzi. Why not? Well, frankly, it's a little out of my grasp at the moment. I don't know anything about the firm, its corporate setup, reasons for bankruptcy, or for that matter, its product. I'm afraid I'll have to pass. Good answer. I respect thoughtful judgment, Mr. Staples. Congratulations. We'll adjourn now until two o'clock. I'm sorry we got started so late this morning, but I wanted this analysis mimeoed for your inspection. After lunch, we'll take up the Portland report, which you have before you. Mr. Granigan attended a stockholders' meeting there on Tuesday, and we'll begin our discussion with his report. That's all. All right, sir. Oh, Bill. All right, come and have some lunch, eh? No, thank you. Oh, uh, Bill, wasn't there something you wanted to speak to me about before? Nothing important. Fine. Tummy's all right, eh? Cast iron. Couldn't be better. Good. Keep it up. Oh, uh, Staples. See you, Bill. You bet. Good to have you with us, Staples. Thank you. The arrangement's satisfactory? Oh, yes, just perfect. I'm sure you'll be hearing from my wife very soon about that. It's a beautiful house. A beautiful country up there. I'm sure you'll love it. Oh, uh... See you later, Bill. Oh, Fred. Briggs is working on a project now, a comprehensive planning report. The point is that it's very important, most important indeed for our future program, and it's far too big a job for Briggs, or for any one man to handle. Now, what I want you to do is get your finger in it. Certainly. What I mean is more than just your finger. You understand? Yes, Mr. Ramsey, you make that quite clear. Oh, could I see you a minute, Miss Fleming? I wonder if you could check for me, please, as to who's to be my secretary. I need some notes typed up. I'm to be your secretary, Mr. Staples. But I thought Mr. Briggs... It was arranged for, just before the meeting, Mr. Staples. I take it you'd rather remain with Mr. Briggs. I was Mr. Briggs' secretary for seven years, Mr. Staples. Well, in that case, I see no reason why I shouldn't be able to get someone else. It was Mr. Ramsey's idea. Do you want to give me those notes now? No, uh, 
Why don't you have your lunch first, Miss Fleming? We'll take care of these when you come back. Darling, you didn't say anything about my new hairdo. Do you like it? Yeah, it's lovely. Wish you could see the new dresses I bought. They're just beautiful. Where are they? Oh, they're still at the store having little things done to them. Well, come on, the kitchen. I'll fix your drink. Not the kitchen. The library. Oh. <laughs> I hope they'd have the dresses ready and have them sent over to your office this afternoon. I spoke to your secretary about it when I called. Well, it's funny she didn't mention it. They didn't get the job done in time. She had a nice voice. What's she like? Who? Your secretary. Oh, what you might expect. You know. What's her name? Well, now, to tell you the truth, I didn't get her name. Only your dimensions. <laughs> All right. No, her name is Fleming. It so happens you don't have a thing in the world to worry about. She doesn't like me worth a bit. Why? Well, I guess she prefers working for a former boss. Well, then why doesn't she? I don't know. Some kind of strategy at the top, I guess. Funny. Yeah. Her ex boss happens to be only one of the vice presidents. My superior and a very nice guy to boot. Could that perhaps be a good sign? Well, you figured out. Left me a little up in the air. You know, Nancy, running a plant in Ohio is beginning to take on all the aspects of a Nice, simple, uncomplicated gravy train. What happened today? Oh, nothing, really. Just an impression, I guess. Sort of queer undercurrents and tensions and... Good luck. Stevens. Fine, thanks, Jerry. Let me see that breakdown again. Oh, sure. Miss Fleming, would you step in for a minute, please? Yes, Mr. Stevens. No, that's number one. Oh, sorry. Let me see this. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is the only one that I have cross index for division, so don't let him keep it. I want uh, Billy to take my letter from Henry Jacobson with him. Oh, yes. Now, look, Billy. Henry is a nice, sincere guy, you know? Made out of Bessemer steel. He hasn't been off of his duff since he learned how to walk. He started out stoking coke furnaces when he's 14, 
was mill foreman when he was 20, and then he ended up buying the whole plant for his own 40th birthday <laughs> present. So, you know what I mean, watch out. I sure will. I give him that report, and then remember what he says. Make stenographic notes when you can, and when you can't, put it all down on paper as soon as you get out of the office. No approximations. Make it as, yes, right, I know I you have to go. Gosh, I right. want to know what they're thinking. I want to know how they feel about every paragraph of that thing. I just hope they'll open up more to you than they did to me. I'll be down there sometime next week for their decision. Okay. Uh, mention that to them, will you? Yes, I will. Hello? Uh, hold it, please, just a second. Have a nice trip, Billy. And be sure and call me Sunday night. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Yes, Bye. put him on. Uh, don't go away, Miss Fleming, please. Hello? Judd. Look, I'm sorry I meant to call you right back. Uh, it's about that Atlantic States Nitrate meeting set up for October the 3rd. I'd like a delay on that. Well, I want to walk in there sure of my ground, and October's not going to give me any ground at all. Yeah, could you do that? Well, that'd be a help. November 7th? Fine. Look, I'll see you in the dining room. Okay, good. Put that on my calendar, please. Now then, uh, where'd you get those wires off? Yes, sir. Good. Right after lunch, I want you to set up a conference call with Ramsey, Jameson, myself, with Frank Daring in Denver. Got a minute, Fred? Sorry, Marge. This is urgent. It's about that NLRB vote in Portland. What about it? Ramsey's grumbling about it. He thinks it's premature. Premature? What's he talking about? He's had that plant running on wishful thinking for 19 months now. We've got a labor problem out there all primed to explode in our face. Now, look, Bill, you better walk in his office with a great big neon sign. Strike, you know? Then tell him I've got a little estimate worked out that it'll cost us conservatively $4,000 a day if that plant goes out. Oof, you know how that'll hit him. Yeah, well, you go in there and dig up the ground, and I'll follow you with a bulldozer, and we'll plow him under. No, we've got 800 big lumberjacks out there, and if they go, that'll do it big, you know. This won't be any one-week picket. This thing could go on for a year with no strain at all. So you walk in there, set the charge, and I'll be in to light the fuse, huh? Fine. I'll have to call you back. Is uh, 2.30 convenient for your call to Denver, Mr. Staples? Do I have anything else on? I got another no, problem out here, if you can spare a minute. Uh -huh. Wow, Paul, how are you, partner? Mr. Staples, that gun. Oh, you got it. Huh? You like it? You try it out yet? Try it yet. 30 seconds from the time he read Winchester Double Barrel on the box, he was sighting it. Well, how about going out for a little skeet shooting on Sunday? Give it a try, huh? Wonderful. Can I, Dad? He's all yours, Fred. He's a little too strenuous for me. Mr. Staples doesn't get tired like you do, Dad. I don't get tired. <laughs> he was an All-American. Well, it was just terrific, so I had to stop by and thank you. You forget it. Well, so long. I'll see you outside. Were you thoughtful of your friend? It was my pleasure, Bill. Hello, Mr. Ramsey. No, How are you, Paul? Still taking your vitamins, are you? I guess so, sir. Fine, fine. Keep it up. Excuse me, Mr. Ramsey. Oh, man, I'm tired. I've made arrangements for your call to Denver, Mr. Staples. If I could go over one paragraph... No, I think I'll knock that off after lunch, if you don't mind, Miss Fleming. All right, Mr. Staples. No, oh, drink it here. Relax a minute. Thank you. I will. Would you like some of mine? Yes, thank you. As a matter of fact, I would. No, that uh, is plenty. Thank you. Where'd you play your football, Mr. Staples? Oh, Ohio State. But don't ask me the years. I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you. Anyway, I feel about three times older than when I first came here. They've kept you busy. Yes, I sure have. You've done very well. You fit it in quickly. Thank you. You know, I think that's the first out-and-out -out friendly thing you've said to me. I think you resent me a little, don't you, Miss Fleming? I don't know why you should... Well, it's just a feeling that I've gotten from time to time. You work with a man for a long time, a fine man. You become part of him. You identify yourself with him. Then along comes the new man. 
I like Bill Briggs. I like him a lot. I have from the first. If I have done or said oh, anything no, that could... Oh, no, no, of course not. Because I must say you've been very fair. But seven years isn't a day. I owe a lot to Mr. Briggs. Mr. Briggs is the last of the original bunch around here, the people who really started this business. That's not easy to be the last of the original bunch. I know. He's not well. He has a bad heart. And an ulcer. I guess that's just about par for the executive course, isn't it? Well, I guess I've always been a field man. I haven't been an executive long enough to find that out for myself. But you're a good one. I think you're a very good executive. You admit mistakes. You don't pass the buck. You're a lot like Mr. Briggs that way. I take that as a very nice compliment. I mean it. Mr. Briggs' only trouble is that he could never be a yes man, not even to Mr. Ramsey himself. He always has to speak his mind. And Mr. Ramsey doesn't like his judgment questioned. You either go along or you get off. Bill Briggs never got off. No, he never did. But maybe he's about to be pushed. Surprised, he blew up at the next round, and then Howard went right by him with a 65. A 65, I ask you. Seven birdies, and he sank an 82-foot putt on the last green for an eagle. Oh, hello, my dear. You know, that's some golf. Yes, indeed, it's wonderful. The coffee will be ready in just a little while. Fine. You know, my, uh, my father's recipe for coffee was to mix salt and chocolate with the grounds. Cook them all up together. He'd never drink anything else. Sounds wonderful. They, uh, they serve it at a small downtown restaurant I eat at occasionally. I must remember to mention it to Fred. You said he was a confirmed coffee drinker? Dedicated. Fine. He's quite a young man, this husband of yours. Have you had a chance to read much of the report? Of course, it isn't finished yet, Well, but... thank you for letting me see this much. Not according to Miss Post, I suppose, at a dinner party, but... It makes me extremely proud of my gentleman. So happy. He's been worried about it, isn't he? Nancy. Will you excuse me? Yes. Wonderful party, you two. Makes me think I should get married. Oh, don't do anything as drastic as that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful having you, Ed. Come again soon. Well, will you try keeping me away? I'll see you at the office yes, tomorrow, Fred. Yes, bright and early, Ed. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Ah, Jamie, you don't have to go yet. Stick around a while. It's early. Of course, I'd love to stay all night, however. We're going home. <laughs> Can't get him out of here, Nancy. Usually, he leaves off his party as soon as the canopy is attacked. <laughs> I thought everybody behaved very well. I thought so. You gotta give some credit for that. Not again. I was beginning to like all of them. Will you come over and see us? Certainly. Come yeah, over during the day? You know, nowadays, Jamie never gets home at all. I think we wives ought to form a union. You're right. Good, sure. night, Good night, dear. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs> I wonder what happened to Bill Briggs tonight. Oh, Darling, I forgot to tell you. He phoned earlier. He said he wanted to come, but he just didn't feel up oh, to it. Oh, Nancy, I wish you'd have called me to the phone. I wanted to talk to but him anyway. Darling, Maybe you were have... busy. Well, I know, but I... What about Ramsey? Is he planning to spend the night? <laughs> no. He just gravitated towards the library and made himself cozy. That sounds a little like artificial gravitation to me. You didn't have anything to do with it, of course. Well, he's really an amazing person. You know, I expected a real tycoon, but he's so simple, almost childlike. Baby, I just hope by mistake you never wander into a jungle. Oh, good night, Jack. Good night, good night, Thank you. Dear. Wonderful class. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Some interesting reading matter here, Fred. Very interesting reading. I took the liberty of accepting your wife's kind invitation to look over your report. Oh, really? Good, heady stuff. Good, solid thinking. And some of it is better than good. Of course, I can't say that I agree with all your conclusions, but I listen to arguments. It'll be good to hear arguments for a change. Good arguments. Well, I can't tell you what a relief that is. We really sweat that one out. Fred, I like a man to show initiative. I like a man who's not afraid to think a new thought, to take a different kind of step on his own. With your permission, I'll uh, borrow this extra copy of your report just overnight. But for now, I can say I'm very impressed. Well, of course, we haven't finished this thing yet, but Bill and I feel that another week... Bill? Week... You mean Briggs? Yes, sir. Well, we work together on this. Oh, come now, Staples. I pride myself on my sense for style. I can link what I see with what I know to be peculiar to a certain individual. And I know Bill Briggs' work. I've been exposed to it since I was of voting age. This... This isn't his style. It isn't his brand of thinking. Well, I don't know what Nancy could have told you, but Bill and I worked Fred, together. Fred, learn to accept success. It's tougher sometimes than learning to accept failure. Don't take half of your accomplishment and, and hand it out gratuitously to the man on your left who hasn't the stuff to do it on his own. That's charitable, humane, and it makes you feel good. But it's not business. Mr. Ramsey, I'd like to clear up one point. There'll be a meeting on Tuesday, Fred. We can discuss the report then. I assure you, I don't want any undue credit. I never extend undue credit. Ask anybody. Ask your friend Briggs. You think I'm tough on him, don't you? I am tough on him. Well, I think Bill is... Uh, I think he's a good man. He was. And grandfather clocks were good clocks, and Stanley steamers were good automobiles, but you can't run them in competition today. I must say that I like some of his ideas very much. Very much indeed. So do I. Some of them. Not many. Still, a man with Bill's experience and... I don't know, I think he'd be very hard to replace. I'll see if that coffee's ready. Are you serious, Fred? Briggs would be hard to replace. Do you honestly think that? And why do you think I brought you on here from Mansfield on such short notice? Do you think that was a whim? Is that what you think? Fred, you're Briggs' replacement. I thought you understood that. I'm expecting his resignation. I don't like to prolong these things. They're unpleasant and personal, no matter what tack you use. And... Uh, under no circumstances could I or would I undertake to fire him. Coffee's in the living room. I thought perhaps you'd like to go in there. It's quiet. Everybody... Look at the time. I, I really must go. It's been a wonderful evening. I'm sorry you have to leave so soon. I really must. My uh, coat, I think, is in the bedroom. Oh, yes, of course. I'll get it for you. May I make a suggestion? Mr. Ramsey, I don't want to seem ungrateful. I'm not looking for gratitude. You can't run a business on thank you notes. That's Briggs' trouble. And God forgive me, that was my father's trouble too. This... This incredible conception of a huge industry being run like a soup kitchen, like a... like a welfare comfort station. I know what the old timers think of me. I've grown up getting stared at by a lot of tongue-plucking old fogies who find me ruthless. The kind of people who represent everything that might have kept our business from growing to anything like its present size. This, this stupid black and white idea that honesty and fair profit are incompatible. I just happen to feel that the atmosphere of a large corporation cannot be constantly cathedral-like.
Thank you, Mrs. Staples. And again, thanks for a wonderful evening. I'll see you in the morning, friend. You didn't steal that promotion. You won it. Remember that. What was that all about? I'm Bill Briggs' replacement. A vice presidency. You must have really spread it on. Listen, a little rare roast beef and wifely pride don't get you that kind of a promotion. Yeah, I'll take something a little more. A little misrepresentation for one thing. A little switch in authorship for another. You told him I'd written that report. I did not. I told him Bill had helped you. But, Nancy, this is Bill's basic idea. Oh, the same set of ideas that he's had for years. I gathered that much. You gave it life. You made it work. You made it practical. Even so, Nancy, I don't want any part of it. Oh, Fred, I happen to know what you contributed to this. I also know that you can't stand winning if you have even a nodding acquaintance with a loser. I don't like stepping on another human being to get into a capital gains bracket. Ramsey's stalking that poor guy like an animal. He'll whip him to death if he has to to make him resign. I didn't hear you tell Mr. Ramsey that he was mistaken. I didn't hear any clear-cut defense of Mr. Briggs. If you don't want to be successful, go and tell that to Nancy. Mr. Ramsey. He'll give you a Will room you and you can check in at 7 o'clock every night, but don't now, tell look, me. Now, look, I don't want to argue about Neither this. Neither do I. I just want you to answer me. Did you tell him that your wife was mistaken? Did you tell him that you were taking vows for something you did not do? No. No, I didn't. Why not, Fred? Why not? Because I want the job. Thank you for a straight and honest answer. Now I think we can both sleep tonight. You gonna be late for school? It's only 8.10. I've still got six minutes. You've got it figured out to a science, haven't you? I've just got it figured to how far I have to go and how long it's gonna take me. Well, if you found that out, you found out a lot. Thanks for breakfast. You worked late again last night. Yeah, no rest for the weary. You haven't got it down to a science yet, have you, Dad? What? How far you have to go and how long it'll take you. What's the matter, Paul? Here, here's last night's doubleheader, the one we were going to see. Oh, I forgot all about it, Paul. I'm, I'm sorry. We didn't miss much. I watched it on television. Crummy doubleheader. The Braves took both of them. You're lucky. The Yanks are playing tonight, aren't they? Yeah, they play the Red Sox. Let's start all over again. You meet me at the office, we'll have dinner, and then we'll go to the game together. Sounds good. It's a date. You're on. So long, Dad. Have a good day, and... Uh, if you can't make it tonight, would you give me a call at school? I've raised the world's worst pessimist. At 8 o'clock in the morning, you're figuring out the worst possible thing that could happen at 6 o'clock tonight. Upstairs in my room, I've... I've got a drawer full of tickets to ball games we've never seen. Because of that stuff. 
But, um, call me if you can't, Dad. It's important. I'll make it this time, son. Can't you have another glass of milk and maybe tell me about last night's doubleheader? I'd be late. Wish I could. So long, Dad. Take it easy. Sure. Hi, Bill. Hi, Fred. I thought it was my son. He's going to pick me up. Got time for a cigarette? Sure. What are you doing here? I thought you were going to the ball game. I've had a miserable headache since dinner. So I sent Paul on to see the game alone. Uh, he's going to pick me up. How long have you been here? A couple of hours, I guess. Can I get you an aspirin or something? Oh, no, no. It's much better now. Anyway, it gave me a chance to look over the supplements you did for the report. I think Ramsey's right, Fred. You may be an engineer by diploma, but you're a crackerjack industrial planner by instinct or something. Coming from you, Bill, that sounds real good. No question about it. Some of your suggestions were great, Fred. Really great. I've incorporated them verbatim. I like your approach, Fred. You think of people in terms of the human factor, not just logistically. Something I've never been able to make Ramsey understand. Anyway, now he can't complain. I turn in the same report every year. He won't be able to say that this year. Join me, Fred? No, thanks, Bill. I've got to pick Nancy up for supper and, and that long drive home, you know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting old. I used to be pretty tough. I'm still tough, I guess. Every now and then, I get tired. Tired of arguments, tired of battling, tired of the whole bloody mess with all this fancy organization and super finagling. Oh, I know it's legal and modern and all that. It's what they call the trend, isn't it? In the old days, things were a lot simpler. Businesses grow, Bill. This business didn't grow, not since old man Ramsey passed on. It's been added to. That's not growth. It's just plain acquisition of business of stock transfers and bank loans, manipulated by hired shysters and their sharpshooting accountants, and organized and controlled by a barracuda like Walter Ramsey. You sure you won't have a snifter, Fred? I wish you would. No. Well, times change, Bill, you know that. But do they always change for the better? Old man Ramsey could walk down a production line and call every man by his first name and get called by his first name in return. No, I, I know that feeling, believe me. He didn't need public relations experts. Honor was enough. Character. And he never sold a share of stock in his company either. Not till the Depression came along and he had to raise cash or go under. And do you know why? because he would not lay off one single man. That's the kind of man Jim Ramsey was. Now I sit in that fancy conference room with Jim Ramsey's son. I sit there and I see all the old man's principles, all his beliefs, every single thing holy to him, jobbed off by this spindly little financial wizard, this wall-eyed, ice 
coated little rooster who knows more about the ventures than he does about the human heart. Hey, Bill. I'm all right. Take it easy. I'm all right. You're beginning to work yourself up. I'm all right. Sit down, friend. Sit down quietly and be a nice, sympathetic friend and associate. I'm wondering if you're as good a human being as you are an industrial relations man. He doesn't like you, does he? No. Bill, has it ever occurred to you to resign? Of course it has. A thousand times. Why don't you? What? Resign. You can't take the chance of letting this man fire you. On our level, you don't get fired. You know that. After 30 years of productive work, they can't say to a man like me, all right, now get out. They just can't do that. So what do they do? They create a situation. A situation you can't work in and finally that you can't live in. Where there's tension, abuse, small humiliations. It all starts out on a scale so subtle, so microscopic, that at first you can't really believe it's happening at all. But gradually the thing begins to take shape. The pieces fit together, all the little bits, and it becomes unmistakable. They chip away at your pride, your security, till you begin to have doubts. And then fear. Ramsey. He wants me to resign. He wants me to get my cross so full that I'll be miserable enough to do just that. But you take it. Yes, I take it. Why? The bigger the job, the more desperately you try to hang Why? on. Why? Why? Why do you take it? Why don't you quit? Quit? Yes, quit. Get out of it. Chuck it. You'd have your pension, your peace of mind. No. You know Ramsey's going to go on hounding you until he makes you quit. Never. You'll never make me quit. Bill, I, I... I wish I could understand why you go on taking it. Because I'm weak, I guess. Because I'm 62 years old and I don't think I could get another job. How does that strike you? How do you think? Once in a while, I have a dream. I dream I'm sitting in that conference room and he starts working me over. I'm just smiling, see? Perfectly calm and I'm taking it. I don't show the slightest resentment. And then, then without any change of expression, I get up out of my chair and I walk over to him. And I say, Ramsey. Bill. Ramsey! Bill! Ramsey, I say, and then I smash him. Bill! And then I smash him again. Bill, get a hold of yourself. And I hit him again. What's and wrong with you? Fall and I hold him up. Bill! Get up, Ramsey, I say, I'm not through you. Bill! Will you... It's the kid. He's coming to pick me up. Fred, I don't want him to see me. Not like this. You're all right, Bill. Just sit down now. No, he can't see me like this. Fred, help me. Help me. All right. All right, I'll take care of him. You just lay low for a minute. I'll see he gets home. Right. Tell him that I left early to get some rest. Bill, please be quiet. Please, Fred, hurry. Be quiet. under orders not to work late. He can't seem to keep away lately. Always work, always worrying. I wonder he's number two man. Suppose I drop you off at Grand Central, hmm? Swell, thanks, Mr. Staples. Ever since I can remember, he's been married to this place. Mom used to say the same thing. They were great together, Mr. Staples. Mom and Dad, they used to yell and argue and carry on. He was a fighter. He was great growing up. Thank you. 
There's another bundle on the truck. Mr. Staples, you left your hat in Mr. Briggs' office. Oh, Fred, I have a Stanley complex made up if you'd like to take a look at it. Here, please. Bad night. Yes, Mr. Stable. Now, this is the proposals report. Give that to Miss Lanier for confidential memoing. Tell her that Mr. Briggs has the only carbon. Is he in yet? No, sir. Mr. Staples? Yes. It's not signed. How would you like the name? In what order? First yours or first Mr. Briggs? Oh, I don't care. It makes no difference to me. But in joint projects, Mr. Staples. I really don't think it's too important. Put Mr. Briggs' name first, if you like. Just give it to Miss Lanier right away. I'd like this thing printed by afternoon, if possible. That's all, Marge. Yes, Mr. Yes, Marge, dear, what is it? The proposal's report. Would you sign it so it can be printed? Oh, would you? Be Just a moment, please. Marge, will you please take it into Mr. Ramsey? He asked to see it oh. first. Hello? Oh, yes, good morning. Is that the report? Yes, sir. Miss Lanier said you wanted to see it. Yes, I do. Who signed this? I wrote the title page. Mr. Staples suggested I sign it. Print it. I'm sure that if Mr. Staples... Print knew... it, Miss Fleming. I can sign that report now, Marge. Now, we meet with Ramsey in 20 minutes. Under the conditions and in the time we got left, it's the best plan I can devise, and it's the only one ready, so you fellas have got to go along. There's nothing wrong with it. Marge! I can Listen, sign that report now. Now, hold us up for a while. You've got to alter Section B and review the Thank you, Marge. The major projects during the period of aforementioned being the Huber Petroleum Refinery, the Sterling Cast Airs Refinery, the Chatham Nickel Smelter Company, the Henderson Valley Dam, the Swing Carbon Steam Plant, and the New England Canadian Natural Gas Pipeline. Good report, Van. Thank you. I got a real feeling of activity during your reading. The next item of business is the project's proposal report. Clearly of the greatest single importance on our docket this morning. I must say, and I'm sure you'll all agree, that I am not given to enthusiasms at the drop of a submission. But of this, I feel impelled to say that it is unique in effort, ingenious in thought. To Mr. Fred Staples of our organization goes my heartfelt thanks and congratulations. Besides being our newest member, he seems to be shaping up as among our most astute. This set of proposals is ingenious, comprehensive, and fresh. Congratulations. Your success is a reaffirmation of my own judgment. Mr. Ramsey. Of my own good judgment, I may add. Mr. Ramsey. I prefer not to be drenched with modesty, Mr. Staples. This is not modesty, just the extension of credit where it's due. Bill here is as Mr. responsible Briggs, as... Is your name about to be used in vain? I don't think Fred would use my name in vain. And it's refreshing to find someone not suffering from over-modesty. What I was trying to say is that we worked on this project together. It's a combined effort. I'm sure it was. Well, as long as that's understood. Oh, it is, it is. It's just that I feel reasonably competent to assess individual performances and to single out uh, those that I feel should be singled out, with all due regard for Mr. Staples' concern for his fellow man. Now then, if Mr. Briggs' ego has been sufficiently nourished... I don't think Fred brought this out to feed my ego. Oh? Well, then, whatever it was that prompted his precipitate dash to your defense... There was no dash to my defense. Why don't we drop the thing, Mr. Briggs? I hate becoming entangled in absurd little personality conflicts. I'll put a star by your name on the front cover if that'll make you happy. My name is no longer on the front cover. Mr. Briggs. You're twisting the entire thing to make it appear as if I were grubbing for some sort of recognition. Mr. Briggs. I find it unfair, Mr. Ramsey. We have a full agenda. 
If you feel so bruised that you must persist in prolonging this discussion... Mr. Ramsey! Let me finish, Mr. Staples, if I may. We have only one purpose here, to work. We cannot hope to accomplish this if we must be continually subjected to these, to these singularly unbecoming strains and tensions, these childish claims and counterclaims. Mr. Briggs, I ask you a simple question. Is it or is it not within my province to credit a man with a job well done? Of course it is. Then may we drop it now? Only if it's clearly understood that I don't submit to any of these calculated discolorations of a man's worth. As to a man's worth, Mr. Briggs, I think I've proven myself a competent judge. I ask you to recall that I built this business from a scratch pile of used lumber and a few machines into a giant. And I made few mistakes in doing it. Few mistakes in business and few mistakes in judging men. Well, you've made one this time. This report... I refuse to engage in a running fight because a supposedly responsible official of this company persists in wasting time haggling over credit. That is not fair. I was not haggling over credit. This is a joint report Don't that we worked on. me what's true and what is not true. What am I, some kind of idiot that I can't recognize another man's thinking? Whatever your abilities in the past, Mr. Briggs, your work hasn't shown this stamp of originality and talent in ten years. A man slips. Clutches, he loses his grip, he tries to hang on by someone else's. You have no right to say that. Bill, will you please speak up? Do, oh, by all means, Mr. Briggs. You think I'm mistaken, do you? Shall I go through 150 pages and point out to you line by line where another man has taken over for you? Has had to take over for you? And I can point out sections of this report that I never had to touch? Had to, Mr. Staples, of course you can. Let me show them to you. I've seen them submitted year after year. Principles and precepts for better business. Mr. Briggs, yearly platitudes. But you translated his unworkable, well-intentioned philosophy into tough business procedure. You make it work. Ramsey! Mr. Briggs, I will not tolerate insubordination on any level. And if anyone here finds that intolerable, he has the God-given right to offer his resignation. Please. Mr. Ramsey. I had no intention of seeming insubordinate. I... Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Staples. Five minutes ago. I just had word from the hospital. He died five minutes ago. Thank you, Mr. Granningham.
Nancy, what are you doing here? I called your office. And there wasn't any train, so I drove here. How did you know where to find me? They told me at the hospital. Does Paul know? Yes, he's with Bill's sister. He's all right. Did you have something, miss? Have you had anything to eat? Hmm? Have you eaten anything? Fred, what happened? Nothing. Not a thing. Except a murder. There were witnesses, too, plenty of us. And no one lifted a finger to stop it. Oh, Fred. Nancy, I know I didn't lift a you finger. don't know. I'm not going to have you going around in sackcloth and ashes for something that you did everything in your power to stop. You begged him to resign. You know that. What more could you have done? What more could anyone have done? Nancy, I think you'd better go home. Would you take this, please? Are you coming? No. Then I won't go. I want you to go home and start packing. Where are we going? I don't know. Somewhere, anywhere. Just away. There's an awful stink in this town, and we're going to get away from it. Come on, I'll put you in the car. No, I'm not going to leave you alone. Nancy, I want you to go home, please. No, I'm not going tonight. Tomorrow I'll do anything you ask. I'll pack, I'll go anywhere you ask, but not tonight. Not in the state you're in. Now, look, there's something I've got to do. Fine. Then we'll do it together. Bill was supposed to go to Lansing tomorrow morning for a meeting with Phillips. You'll have to take his place. I believe I've already mentioned that. Yeah, you mentioned it. You leave on flight number 116, 832 from LaGuardia. Miss Lanier will meet you at the airport with your reservation and all the memoranda and correspondence pertaining to the negotiation. You'll have three uninterrupted hours in the air to familiarize yourself with all the details. I have no interest whatever in the Phillips matter. What was that? I'm telling you that I don't want the job. I'm through. I'm quitting. I resign as of now. Why? Because I hate your guts. You used Bill Briggs for a whipping boy. You made him knuckle under and then you beat him to death. You wouldn't try anything like that with me because I'd kill you first. I'm not a nice human being. What else? You're nothing but a freak. You drive your people into peak efficiency if they can make it or a grave if they can't. Because Bill Briggs lacked the strength and the capacity. Up. He was second in command. He had a lot of responsibility to hold and he cracked up. It was his business too. It's no one's business. It belongs only to the best. To those who can control it, sustain it, nurture it, keep it growing. Right now it belongs to us because we're producing. But in the future, it belongs to whoever has the brains, the nerve, and the skill to take it away from us. Well, they can have my share of it right now because I don't want any part of it. What do you want from me? Apologies? I don't apologize. What else? A nice, unsullied conscience. You walk out of here with a halo because you spoke your mind. What do you do then? Go to work for some nickel and dime outfit run by nice people? who won't challenge you and prod you and goad you and drive you to a height you never even dreamed of? A company where there's nothing to fight for because you're the best and there's no competition? Where everything is handed to you and nothing is worth fighting for? I want you to stay. 
I don't think you understand, Ramsey. I don't like you. I don't like anything about you. I didn't hire you to like me. All right, I'm not a nice person in your eyes. But whatever I am, you learn more, grow more, and do more here with me than anywhere else on Earth. I want you to stay because I need help on my level. And you're the only one who's able to function there. Be a conscience for me if you want. Be anything you like. And if it's something I don't like, you'll know about it soon enough. I think you're strong enough to take it. And if not, I think you're strong enough to get out. Name your terms. All terms are negotiable. I don't think so. Not mine. All right. I just assume not waste any time doing trading. As of now, your salary is doubled. Your stock option is doubled right down the line. Your expense account is whatever you make it. Add to that a new title, Vice President. I want a lot more than that. You're not going to take me on as just another Vice President you can push around. You take me as someone who hates you down to the bare nerve. Nothing in the world will ever change that. I'll argue with you, contradict you, fight you in every way I know how. I'll do everything in my power to push you out and take your place myself. Go ahead and try. Mr. Staples, you have yourself a deal. Have it drawn up. No reservations now? Yes, one. Bill had one pitiful little dream that someday he'd walk in here and break your jaw. I reserve the right to have that wish for myself. I'll have it drawn into the contract with a little rider giving me the same privilege. Oh, uh, Staples, you'll be pleased to know that Bill Briggs' boy is being taken care of. Will that let you sleep better tonight? It begins, huh? It begins. Fair enough? Fair enough. Do we pack? No. We stay. On whose terms? Mine. And his. Are you satisfied? Yes. Oh, Fred. You know, it's easy enough to chuck some things you think is wrong. But, I don't know, this way maybe there's a chance. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, we'll see. I've got to go to Lansing. When will you be back? Tomorrow night. I'll be late. Aren't you always? 